The giant space cockroaches are eating out the lights. Hi guys. So, today I'm going to start something that will hopefully be a fairly regular thing. And uh, 10 things I love about, and then clearly it's going to be different things each time. And uh, I really want to do a video on Farscape, because I love Farscape. There's two of the official companions there. Uh, that's the first one, I think. That's the first one, and that's the third one. I've got all of them. I wanted to find The Uncharted Territories, which is a really good book, which is like an episode guide, and it's got loads of little links in there about uh, different ways the episodes correlate, and that kind of thing. But, anyway, I just wanted to talk about how cool it is, the reasons why it's such a good show, uh, why it's my favourite show, really. Um, I've got lots of other favourite shows, and uh, I will be dipping into this TV thing through this 10 Reasons That I Love series of videos I want to do. But I won't just be doing TV, so I can do some other things as well. But I'm definitely going to do some TV shows, though, and this is definitely going to be the first one I do, because I think it's so underrated... So with the danger of either preaching to the converted or um, saying stuff that doesn't sound that impressive and you think, well, what's he on about? It sounds pretty ordinary. Or just uh, not really living up to the actual experience of watching the shows. Here are 10 things I love about Farscape. Do not make me tell you. So straight off the bat, one of the most striking and obvious things about the show, as soon as you start watching it, is the effects. So the effects are provided by Jim Henson's Creature Shop. And what the work they do on the, on the show is phenomenal. So they used all the experience they had and stretched some of the possibilities they wanted to do by just trying new things out throughout doing the show. Um, it was produced by Brian Henson, Jim Henson's son, and he was a key part of the process of creating the show. And he wanted to explore this otherworldliness in the effects. And you really get that. So whereas... You've got a lot of TV science fiction where an alien was basically a humanoid with some something covering their face or something that looks a little bit different, like a birthmark or something. Uh, this was different because every step of the way they tried to make things look really alien and really different, and um, it's so clever the way they did it, and it makes it just compelling even in the weaker episodes. So there are some weaker episodes. I was I was having another look through the um, episode guides, um, and there are definitely some weaker episodes, but all the way through it. That aesthetic, that look that the Creature Shop creates just makes it amazing. ship the spaceship that is um, the center of the show it's called a leviathan and its uh, name is moya and that's what the main crew the main characters in the show are traveling on and it's a living ship so um, biomechanical ships have been uh, in science fiction before but not in the way this is so um, you could say there's an influence from the volon ships in Babylon 5 um, another show i love by the way but the way that Moya is done in the show and the way the effects are created in the show for this feel is so unique, I think. And it really is a living ship in a true sense of the word. So uh, one of the obvious things effects wise with the production design is the, uh, the inside of the ship looks like the inside of a body. Um, you can sort of you can see these sort of like muscles and tendrils as the bulk of the ship as they're walking through the corridors and that and that kind of thing. Um, just really adds to the atmosphere. So um, the creature shop, you know, just with the main ship, just looking at that, you can be impressed with that. But all of the creatures that um, inhabit the world of Farscape are somehow adapted by the creature shop. And some of them are just animatronic puppets, and some of them are um, just um, things that couldn't possibly be humanoid because of the size or 
You know, sometimes they're operated by loads of people, like the pilot of the ship. Sometimes they're operated by um, remote control. Sometimes they're smaller things. But they're, they're, they're always trying new ways of creating aliens, and it's such a brilliant um, example of how practical effects can be done really creatively to create awesome kind of alien otherworldliness in a TV show. And it's had a huge influence on other things as well. So, yeah, the creature shop and the way that the production design and the aliens are done with the effects, definitely number one. Okay, I wasn't expecting to have to put another insert into the video as I was editing it, but one of the sections in the video doesn't work. Um, this might happen again in a minute, but I'm doing this bit again because it didn't upload properly. So, uh, the second uh, reason why I love Farscape is John Crichton. John Crichton is such a fantastic lead character. Ben Browder acts him brilliantly. You know, it's almost sort of made for him. You know, you, you, the way that the character's mannerisms, the way he talks, goes with uh, what seems to be Ben Browder's way of working. It seems to be really good. It seems to work um, exceptionally well. And the dialogue is just brilliant. There's so many great examples of how he knowingly talks to the audience. It's not quite a fourth wall because he doesn't directly talk to the camera. He's kind of talking to himself. And sometimes he's talking to these other characters and they don't know what he's talking about because they don't get the cultural references. But uh, it makes for a lot of humour. It kind of reinforces the idea that he's confused or he's in an alien place or he doesn't know what to expect. Um, and that kind of elevates the bravery in lots of ways. Um, but, you know, it, it's just a great element to the show. The main character being such a great central point for the stories and his journey is compelling, the way he acts it, and his dialogue. I'll give you some examples of his dialogue. So um, there's a great one that sums up um, that sort of fourth wall aspect, where at one point he says, God, I love science fiction. <laughs> uh, and there's also uh, there's one that you see quotes sometimes, um, I try to save a life a day, usually it's mine. It's almost Woody Allen-esque in its uh, um, almost self-deprecation. Um, and then there's like those cultural references are things like when he calls Rigel Yoda, or there's one point where he says, I'm going wabbit hunting, uh, clearly a Looney Tunes reference. And uh, there's a bit where he says, flying through wormholes ain't like dusting crops, farm boy. Uh, <laughs> clearly a Star Wars reference. Um, and there's a bit as well where he's freaked out with some aliens, and he says, boy, Spielberg got it wrong. Um, uh, Close Encounters, my ass, something like that. Um, and uh, one more, just for... Um, good measure. Uh, there's one point where he says to the crew, let's be really, really quiet so the Pirates of the Caribbean can't hear us. <laughs> That's just a reference to the kinds of people they were facing that were a bit like Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, so, yeah, all that stuff makes it really fun to watch. Um, and I think it does um, create that alienness as well. So it makes him separate from everything else because most of the time he's so freaked out by what's happening around him, certainly through the early parts of the series. Um, as he gets more um, close into the characters, it's not as elevated, but it's still a big part of the show, all the way through the show. So bouncing off that, the script writing in general. So um, the scripts are so full of um, great humour, great sarcasm, great um, insights into the relationships that develop on the, sh on the ship. And the characters themselves change throughout the show and their motivations change and their... Um, their attitude to each other and to their own mission changes, which I'll go on about in a minute, actually. I'm, I'm delving into another number here. But the dialogue in general is just so good. So um, it's not just the dialogue as well. The plots are really interesting. So there are some kind of standard, kind of cliché plots in the first series, um, but it kind of picks up pace and starts to get really experimental once it gets going, I think. And I think that could be because um, they wanted to sort of not be too wild at the beginning, um, but I think a lot, once they start putting the pieces in place that make it freakier, then the plots get freakier. And it really does get freaky <laughs> at times. Yeah, I'll, I'll delve more into the uh, the reasons why the dialogue's really good and the, and the scripts are really good in some of the other points I'm going to make. But it's a good general point that, again, even in the weaker episodes, the relationship between the characters and the, the way that the, um, the, the episodes are written um, keeps you keeps it going and keeps it really interesting so yeah the the dialogue in general brilliant okay the surprises uh, this is a really big one the surprises in the show but clearly i can't really say too much because there won't be surprises anymore so there is a risk of spoiling it here but 
Now, I can say some general stuff and I can make some points that don't necessarily spoil it. So, for example, in the first season, there's an incredible episode called DNA Mad Scientist. And uh, if you're not sure whether you like the show and you wanted to try the episode out first, um, I think it's it's better where it is because it's later on in the season and by then things have started to settle down a bit and you start believing maybe they've just become friends or something. But then the DNA Mad Scientist totally changes it because a basically a scientist tells them that for a price, he can um, do what they want to do. So they've all got these different um, personal missions. John Crichton wants to go home. Um, Aaron, the Claudia Black character, she wants to get back with the peacekeepers um, because she's been exiled from that. And uh, Rigel wants to get back and reclaim his throne. Um, Daga wants revenge um, on someone that broke up his family. They're, they're all, they've all got different motivations, but this scientist offers them the answer to that as long as um, they uh, give him something back and what he's asking for is horrific I mean genuinely horrific and uh, the way that the plot uh, moves you don't expect them to take him up on the offer but you also don't expect this absolute um, caving in of their relationships and the way they all go against each other because they're so desperate so that is a huge sign that says that the show is going to be a little bit different. And then you've got, in the same season, you've got um, a human reaction. A human reaction is another great surprise one. Again, I don't want to spoil it, um, but it starts off with seemingly, especially so early in the series, John Crichton's got home and he's back on Earth and uh, it looks like um, he can sort of see his dad again, see his best friend again, and get back to work again, all that, and, but it still starts unravelling, and things are not quite what they seem, and, uh, and that episode has another payoff in the second season, and loads of episodes later, and it picks it up again, and that sets up the rest of the entire series, and all those kind of um, script elements just make it so special, so yeah, Human Reaction is another real flag to say how interesting the writing is, and how they kept trying new things. And then one last thing about the script. This is again in the first season. Because it because the first season ha does have some issues. But it also has some incredible episodes. Second half of the season. The last episode called Family Ties. Starts off with Rigel. He's someone you would not want to share a ship with. Because he you can't trust him basically. And he goes off to try and strike a deal. With the current villain of the show. And... Uh, uh, basically, it all goes wrong. But one of the right reasons why it goes wrong is something really dramatic has happened with the, happening with the ship that you would not expect, and I'm not going to spoil it, but it's such a great part of the show. And again, um, this is true for Farscape in general. It, it runs with this plot, and this thing that happens to the ship becomes um, very consequential, and there's lots of things that happen because of it, and they never just let something go. It surprises all over the series right up to when it finally ends in the uh, Peacekeeper Wars miniseries so yeah surprises is a big part of the show so the fifth point changing loyalties and changing motivations in in the characters it's not just the motivations and the loyalties changing the whole characters change their the way they relate to each other changes the way they relate to their own personal angst and their own personal demons and their own personal uh, issues that changes through the series as well um, and again, it wouldn't happen unless, one, they were bouncing off each other, two, it really was realistic and you felt like you kind of um, could sort of feel for them and, and you thought it made sense. And again, the acting is done really well. So someone that was painted quite early on when the show first came out, Dargo, as just a wolf ripoff, is absolutely not a wolf ripoff. And one of the reasons why he's not is because his character develops so much and he's so much more than just a sort of gruff... Um, sort of warrior-like security guard which is certainly um, a lot of the um, Wolf characterization. I'm a big fan of Wolf by the way he's my favourite Star Trek character but what they do with Dargo is, is different to that so it shouldn't, he shouldn't be written off as a Wolf uh, rip-off so, uh, so yeah the way that you can't trust Rigel the way that actually you can't even trust Zan and Tiana because they all um, keep they, there are moments when they um, betray the rest of the crew because of personal reasons or family reasons or, or things that they that instinctively they can't ignore. All those kind of things uh, make for compelling viewing. 
Okay, uh, this is a big one. The uh, sixth uh, point I was going to make about why I love Farscape is the, the wildness and the frivolity and the weirdness in the show. A lot of people will just make a general point about how weird it is and uh, it sounds like it could be just off the wall and it doesn't make sense and it's just weird for the sake of weird, but it's not because it's always written in the, in the script and in, in the, the development of the characters and the plot but it's still weird and they'll just come up with stuff that you just think, oh, that's new. Just an a ongoing thing that makes it quite weird and they really play with it is the hallucinations that John Crichton gets because one of the main villains, possibly the best villain of TV history, Scorpius, he puts a chip in John Crichton's mind um, at the end of season one that starts sort of uh, coming into being properly through the beginning of the second season, he starts getting these hallucinations that John Crichton calls Harvey, and the Harvey character, whenever he's in it, he gets a little trippier and gets quite funny, and, and they play around with um, different um, film tropes and, and that kind of thing when they're doing these hallucinations. Uh, quite early on in the first series, one of the uh, problems that the crew has got gets solved by uh, Rigel's urine. That, that solves a huge problem they've got and uh, and that that's is so typical of the show but it's a great moment where you go okay this is different and uh, there's things later on with there's a lot of bodily fluids in the show in general really so I won't say too much but there are quite a lot of bodily fluids in the show and uh, there are there's a, a really um, intense episode called Eat Me which is basically kind of a zombie episode but um, the atmosphere and the weirdness of the episode is really creepy. It really was genuinely creepy. It, it kind of it made your flesh crawl a little bit while you were watching it, partly because of the production design and the acting and the the sound design. It's quite a horrific episode. It's brilliantly done. Um, but that's another example. There's loads of examples. You know, I mean, there's one episode where it becomes a cartoon for most of the episode, like a Looney Tunes style humor cartoon. I can't believe I left a nuclear bomb in an elevator. I'm oh, sorry. You've done worse. And that was basically built around Dargo and Crichton falling out. And then they just sort of created this cartoon episode out of it. Um, and, it, you know, it's great. I mean, you get other series like Communities played around with that sort of thing now. But this is years ago. So I think Community was influenced by Farscape rather than just Farscape being one of many shows that did it. It seemed to be the first, that's, that to me, that seemed to be that weird. So, yeah, the weirdness the virality, the wildness of the show, I think is a really, really big plus in it and quite unique, I think, the way they did it. I've already touched on this, but I want to make this a separate point, and that is the confrontation and the conflict within the characters. Um, as I said, Rigel was very um, untrustworthy, um, but in general, there was always a sense of, if someone did portray the characters, it wouldn't be that weird, because they were always on the edge of possibly not doing that, and their friendship grew quite slowly, I mean, by the end of the show, I'd say Crichton and Dargo are like brothers and they call each other brothers by the end of it. But there's all sorts of other stuff going on and there's moments where it all seems to be falling apart. And also, towards the beginning of season three, things start settling down a little bit as far as their characters go. And they chuck two more characters in to sort of throw the, uh, the, the sort of settled nature of it up in the air a little bit. And uh, they, they keep doing that to make sure that uh, it stays fresh and you get back that confrontation that you get. So I think that's a really clever thing they kept doing, and the, the way that the Scarrans become the main villains towards the end of the show means that Scorpius's role, who's the really big villain for the whole thing, but his role changes. And also the first villain, Bilar Crace, his role changes as well, and his loyalties change, and he becomes a very grey area as far as his personality goes and what he wants, and his relationship with the main characters changes and he becomes a really focal point at one moment in the show of um, trying to deal with a huge issue they've got. So um, his, his, um, his arc, his story arc, Bill like Crace's story arc, is one of the best things about the show, actually. Um, so then again, he starts off being a very black and white villain with a very um, superficial revenge plot going on, but it becomes very interesting what they do with him. So... So yeah, that whole divided loyalties thing, really interesting the way they play with it. Okay, the eighth point I was going to make, cliffhangers. 
cliffhangers. They are so good at it, and their cliffhangers are huge. So clearly, it's four seasons. So that's four cliffhangers. Because sadly, because they were cancelled, the um, last episode of season four is a cliffhanger. They thought they were going to keep going. They did manage to finish it. They did keep going, but the fourth series does end with a cliffhanger. Yeah, the first series ends with this huge thing that happens to the ship, and that changes everything and changes the nature of their relationship with each other. And that's, that's a really big cliffhanger. So you think, oh, I want to see more. Um, but there are other cliffhangers where, I mean, the, the classic one is the one at the end of season three, where um, uh, <laughs> for various reasons, uh, Crichton's left in the middle of nowhere uh, on his own, and he says, some, I think his line is, you've got to be kidding me, I think. Um, but it's like, it's just at the right at the last moment of the episode, and you're like, "What?" Um, and uh, and the and the series four cliffhanger is brilliant as well. But again, I don't want to spoil too much, so I won't say why. But that's another moment you just say, "What's just happened? I need to see more." So they were really good at cliffhangers. Okay, so the ninth point I want to make about the show: if you aren't dying to watch the show already, then you need to watch this video again. Um, but it was cancelled. And it looked like they weren't going to finish the story because there is an overarching story amongst all these little stories. There's a big thing happening that is connected to the chip that was initially put in Crichton's brain and um, the developing plot around that. Um, it becomes quite kind of intergalactic in the sense that the Scarens are quite a major um, alien force that are trying to dominate um, other species and they become interested in what's in his head. And all that kind of stuff needed to be resolved, basically. And what happened was there was a huge Save Farscape campaign um, online. I think it might have been one of the first online campaigns to save a show. And uh, it was saved. There was two specials made, two two-hour specials, so four hours of more Farscape to finish the story off. And it was so great because they knew it was the last shout. They, got, they brought loads of other characters in. They wrote it in a way that meant that there was a little bit of a best of Farscape thing happening, which was quite cool. And uh, it was just a fantastic... Um, way to finish the show it was a brilliant way to finish the show and it's such a good ending it's such a it, it's there's one thing i wish they'd changed i said this when i mentioned fastgate before but that's just a personal thing that is not really a fault in the writing it's just you know if it hadn't have happened and there's more fastgate you know that thing wouldn't have happened i'm being very vague because no one spoiled it but yeah the peacekeeper wars is a really cool way of finishing the um series that was already trying to best itself all the time and then they managed to bring it all together for this huge climactic finish that was all based around a genuine uh, scientist mathematician in Crichton and how he was going to try and deal with what was in his head while there's all these aliens these different people trying to get hold of it so yeah fantastic so that's the peacekeeper wars great element to the show and the last reason I'm going to give is the incredible character, full rounded three dimensional villain, Scorpius. He looks like this. And uh, the acting is phenomenal, his dialogue is phenomenal. Uh, he's absolutely compelling. And just as soon as his arrival happens at the late part of the first season, uh, the whole show changes and there's this new dynamic. Every appearance that he has in the show is so brilliant. He drives the plot as well because uh, what he does to Crichton at the end of the first season has huge consequences um, starting in the beginning part of the second season and running through till the end and uh, his sort of pursuit of Crichton is a big part of the drive of the plot in the later seasons so um, and, and his pursuit is based around something very real that he discovers when he's torturing him uh, so yeah, um, absolutely phenomenal. And there's this extra element to Scorpius besides his like brilliant dialogue and this sort of understated um, nastiness that, that Wayne Pygram plays with him. Um, but as well as that, uh, he's half Sebastian and half Scarron. So therefore, his internal temperature is fluctuating all the time, and he has to have this sort of rod that maintains a particular kind of temperature that he can live with. And that sometimes becomes an issue for him when uh, he needs to replace it or it just gets a bit hectic for him. And that's a really cool thing that comes out into the plot sometimes. But yeah, Scorpius is just a phenomenal, phenomenal character. So yeah, 
Um, loads of reasons why I love the show. Um, it really is quite a special thing. It's now on Amazon Prime in this country. So please watch it if you are in Britain and you can watch it because it's definitely worth it. You might have to watch five or six episodes of the first series to really get going maybe because like I said there are weak episodes but the overall feel of it is so cool and the way the script's written it just gets better and better and better and better I mean John Crichton's mission at the beginning is to get home and forgetting about the bit where he's tricked in the human reaction episode when he does get home he does get home at some point and when he does it's written so well because things don't turn out like he would expect and like um we would expect so that's done really well so you know all of these things pay off you know the one thing they did do even though they didn't have this sort of thing mapped out i remember the writers saying that they always knew the beginning of the seasons and the middle and the end of the seasons and they sort of do these little clever things in between to sort of make it a little spicy and make it a little bit weird um and i think they always had these things planned out but they just made it more interesting as they were going along so um there's loads of payoffs as you watch it and there's loads of um, things that reference previous episodes. Loads of aliens that come back and they don't forget the previous encounter they had with them. And that's really important. Um, so, you know, there's lots, lots of things that, that gets built up over the show. So, yeah, watch watch a whole season. No, no, I'll tell you what, watch a whole watch the whole thing. And then if you like it, then watch it again. Um, now, watch, well, no, tell you what, you don't have to watch the whole thing. Watch four seasons of it. And then once you've watched four seasons of it, you can judge whether you want to watch Peacekeeper Wars or not. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, it's an amazing show. You should watch Farscape. Uh, that was 10 things I love about Farscape. Bingo! Give Brainiac the fluffy doll. And uh, see you later. Bye. Yeah.